and good afternoon everybody. This is the Good to Grow workshop for Nevada County and we have our participants are here and we have our attendees are filing in as, we, as I speak. Uh, this event is a co-production between Nevada County and UBANET so thank you for the county as usual for their assistance. And uh, let's kick it off uh, with uh, short intros. Tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, why are you here? So, um, Craig, why don't you kick off, please? Hi, my name is Craig Griesbach. I'm the director of the Building Code Compliance and Cannabis Compliance Departments of the county. Um, really happy to be able to do some outreach during this time. I know it's challenging, um, but we're looking forward to providing some information for you today. Jason? Yeah. So my name, my name is Jason Besaw. I'm a cannabis compliance officer with Nevada County. And what I do is I review permit applications for the cannabis compliance division and building. And I, uh, I'm the one that ultimately comes out and gives you your, your final pass for the inspection. And just here to help people uh, through the process and become legal. Excellent. And um, then we have Diana. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Diana Gamzon. I'm the executive director of the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance, and we are the local cannabis trade association. Uh, we're a membership based organization. 90% of all licensed and permitted cannabis farms and businesses in Nevada County are Alliance members. And um, we host um, what we call our Get Legit Workshop Series, Education Series, which provides regulatory assistance, business skills assistance, support groups, uh, buddy program. We do lots to help uh, ensure that we have a thriving, strong, educated local cannabis industry. Perfect. And uh, Janae, who are you? Hi, I'm Janae. I work for the Central Valley Water Board's Cannabis Permitting and Compliance Unit. Um, I normally am the staff member for Lake County and Michael Cook would be the staff member for Nevada County. He's on leave right now, so I'm here to answer any questions and help uh, get through the water board process of getting permitted. Perfect. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Ashley. Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Overhouse. I'm the River Policy Manager at the South Yuba River Citizens League, uh, more affectionately known as CIRCLE. CIRCLE aims to inspire the community to engage in sustainable and ecologically sound cannabis through our program called Growing Green for the Yuba. And our vision for Growing Green is to help the public understand how regulation can be a tool that allows agriculture to align with the objectives that maintain water quality and promote habitat for fish and wildlife. And in partnership with important community cannabis stakeholders, many of them on this call, we're hosting educational and on-farm workshops, hopefully eventually in person, promoting best management practices and participating in additional collaborative leadership, science, stewardship, and education. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. And uh, Kyle. Hi, everyone. My name is Kyle Stoner. I'm a senior environmental scientist specialist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I work in our cannabis permitting uh, and compliance program out of Region 2, which covers Nevada County. We're at a ranch of Cordova. Um, and so I primarily work on permitting projects within the county and getting folks to make these permit alteration agreements or uh, notification that one is not required. Glad to be here and hope I can answer some questions that folks have. And of course, no, uh, these days, no webinar is complete without having some representative from our fire agency. So let's start with uh, Terry McMahon. Well, good evening, Terry McMahon. I'm the fire marshal at Nevada County Consolidated Fire District. We cover about 150 square miles of the county, uh, Western Nevada County, kind of around the two cities. And uh, so if your projects in our jurisdiction um, I'm the one you deal with, and thanks for having me. And uh, Scott, what about you? Can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry, some technical difficulties. Hi, Scott Eckman, Deputy Farm Marshal for Nevada County for the unincorporated areas. 
uh, outside of the two cities and outside of consolidated and Penn Valley's fire districts, I will be your fire marshal ins um, inspecting and uh, ensuring life safety uh, for public and fire personnel alike. Short and sweet. Lucas. My name is Lucas Cannell. I'm here with uh, Nevada County's Planning Department, and we are the project managers for the larger grows, uh, 2,500 square feet or over. Uh, we are doing the scientific CEPA review on your projects, and we will be also looking for uh, resource impacts on any of the projects. And speaking of resource impacts and what it can do to the environment, Amy Irani. Amy, you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you all hear me? You can, okay. Hi, uh, sorry, I'm having really bad internet connections, so um, hopefully I won't lose you. Um, Amy Irani, uh, Environmental Health Department. Um, we have some review uh, regarding your operation with specific respect to wells and septics. Um, so, uh, we're here as a resource and, uh, happy to be on board. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, <clears throat> one of the, um, questions that, uh, we received ahead of time was the, where do I start? I want to do this and where do I start? How does one start the process? Craig, could you maybe take that? Yeah. yeah. I'll take it. Um, really starting in the process is starting the conversation with all these people you see on this screen. So it's getting to know who does what, who do you need to talk to at the county and outside the county? What exactly are you wanting to do? Um, a lot of this is based on, you know, do you have property already? Are you looking for property? Um, do you have a as-built grow already on a portion of the county? So really, where's your starting point and what information do you need to provide? So the first stop, I would say, um, would be, be coming by our office or shooting us an email or a phone call. And we can help you go in the right direction, whether that's giving you some resources that we have or connecting you with the Alliance or Circle or the fire departments. Uh, it's really just having that initial discussion with us. Um, and Jason, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Yeah, so um, we get a, we filled a lot of calls of people asking, um, particularly about land. So there are some people that already have land, some people from out of county, or maybe they're just looking for additional land within the county. And the, the most basic thing is to look at where you want to purchase the land, make sure it's the right size for the grow you want, make sure it's zoned uh, properly, uh, pay attention to setbacks. Um, how close you are to schools, parks. Those are some of the, the bigger items that people will want to pay attention to right off the bat that could hold up or ultimately stop a project. Um, and I'll add in here, one of the things that we do when we get these, this call, where do I start uh, here at the Alliance, is we try to talk to people about their business plan. What um, have they thought about um, how they'll be selling, what method of growing they'll be doing, uh, what makes the most sense for their property. Again, if they're looking for property, we can help connect them with people who are, are selling their property. And with our buddy program, uh, we have an initial assessment where we um, pair them with a farmer that has already been permitted. And there's about 12 key questions that are asked. Do you rent or own your property? Um, a whole bunch of questions that helps people kind of just assess the viability of their project from the start um, and then at the start of every grow season we have a farmer to farmer roundtable where we talk about budget costs timelines a whole bunch of considerations that you want to know in addition to just looking at the regulations to try to help people so that they're not blindsided as they go through the process excellent and uh, Ashley do you um from your perspective, uh, is it okay, uh, should people get in touch with Circle? 
Yes, absolutely. We have some incredible river science staff um, that can help uh, recommend best management practices. So in addition to the incredible guidance from county staff and the resources that the Alliance provides, Circle can really help try to mitigate some of those environmental issues. And um, I think that that's something the resources that Circle can help us provide for those that are interested. And that's, that's great. And uh, at some point, of course, that is when the, um, the state becomes involved and uh, Janae, you would be uh, one of the, well, your shop would be one of the, the, the state agencies involved in this. Yeah, so one of the things that you need in order to get your county permit is your water boards permit. And we have a portal, if you just type in water boards, cannabis, it's the first thing that pops up in Google. Uh, get into the portal, get registered. Um, once you, it will ask you some questions, figure out what tier you belong in and what risk, and then you can contact us and we have some reports you have to do and then you'll be permitted with us. Okay, and Kyle, uh, anything special for you? Um, just one thing that I'm starting to recommend for folks in the county is to just come to CDFW with a complete project description. We're finding that the robust permitting process the county has in place is kind of um, maybe requiring some last minute changes to projects that have already been permitted through us and are coming to have in and having to do amendments to the project. So um, there's nothing keeping you from notifying right away or applying for your lake and stream and alteration agreement at, at any time. But um, it's something to keep in mind to make sure you have a complete project description that's not likely to change. And then specifically, we're seeing some projects where uh, certain fire code um, sections are requiring roads to be widened and therefore also culverts being widened, and that would require a permit. Um, I'm sorry, I'm hard, hard, hard to hear. Is it a little better if I get closer? Or should I just speak up? Absolutely, a little bit more? that's that's better. Okay. So just having a complete project description, um, and then reaching out to all these resources um, that you have to to try and like design your site in the best way to avoid impacts of sensitive resources, specifically streams. And um, another question that um, comes up. Can I get a license to grow indoor and outdoor at the same time? So Jason, how about you take that one? Yeah. So um, as long as you have that, that license uh, through the state, then um, on your application with the county, again, as long as it reflects uh, what you have with the state, we will allow both indoor and outdoor. Um, but the combined total is still uh, within your canopy. So if you're allowed, if you have over 20 acres, and you're allowed 10,000 square feet, it's not 10,000 indoor and 10,000 outdoor. It's combined between the two. So you could have 5,000 indoor and 5,000 outdoor. But again, that just has to be reflected on your application. And uh, we were speak, uh, speaking of canopy. So uh, what type of licenses are available uh, and can you maybe talk about the various um, side parcel sizes and how much uh, canopy uh, is available per um, acreage? So um, I'm not terribly familiar with the, the state process. Um, I believe most of their licenses that would match uh, what we have here in Nevada County is um, cottage or small. Um, but the way it's tiered, um, you have to be zoned ag, ag exclusive or forest um, to be eligible to have a commercial medical cannabis. And from two to 4.99 acres, you're allowed 500 square feet of indoor only. From five acres up to 9.99, you're allowed to have 2,500 square feet of canopy. And that falls under our CCP, um, permitting process, which is a, a lower threshold and a little bit quicker turnaround for those smaller grows. And then when you get up to 10 acres to 19.99 acres, you're allowed up to 5,000 square feet of canopy. And 20 acres or more, you're allowed up to 10,000 square feet of canopy. Um, and those are our ADP, our Administrative Development Permits. They're a little bit more extensive, and thus we have a little bit longer turnaround um, on reviewing those applications. And um, are the 
uh, all the um, the permits that are being issued are they valid within city limits? They are not. They are only good for the unincorporated uh, county territory. Yeah, that's uh, because we have uh, a few people that come uh, that are in Grass Valley within Grass Valley city limits. So that this would not apply to them. That is correct. It would not apply within the town of Truckee limits, Nevada City, or Grass Valley uh, city limits. And uh, we have a question here in the Q&A section. In an ag exempt greenhouse, can you have more than one low voltage system if each system is under 50 watts and 25 volts? Who wants to take that? So I, I, I can take that one. Um, we have been reviewing any sort of low voltage system on a case by case basis. For the most part, the projects that we've approved have um, included one uh, light and possibly one fan that meets that exemption threshold for um, lighting and mechanical per the electrical and mechanical codes in the state. So with that said, we have been reviewing them on a case by case um, because the ag exempt structures have been allowed to be increased over this last year. Um, so we have, we've been seeing a lot of different designs, a lot of different setups um, that we haven't seen before. So again, Review them on a case by case basis with the most common being uh, one of each in one structure. And uh, we have um, Jennifer who uh, just joined our webinar and she had a question regarding variances because she has uh, several parcels. Her neighbor, the gardens are pretty close and they've been told that they have to move, they would have to move the gardens. Is there any way to? get a variance? I can take that question. Um, so there is a 100 foot setback from property lines to cultivation sites or cultivation activities. Um, we do allow for people to apply for variances, but there is very specific findings that need to be made at a variance and they need to be presented in a public forum uh, at the zoning administration meeting. So you would have to prove that there's some specific aspect of your property that puts you at a disadvantage compared to similar properties in your area. If we're unable to make that finding, we would be unable to approve the variance. What if the uh, the neighborhood is uh, would agree to um, to the variance because it would uh, actually preserve some uh, some forest land? Uh, unfortunately, land use permits cannot take people's personal feelings into consideration, so they would have to meet the intent of the law. Okay. Um, is there any chance the county will extend the transitional license option past May of 2021? If not, does this mean one has to have all the requirements for the permit completed at the time of applying? So I can take that one. Um, the transition period right now, as it's listed in the ordinance at sunsets after two years from adoption. So that isn't saying you have that time period to bring your property into compliance. That's just that code section being in the ordinance and effective during that period. So if you apply for your permit on the very last day of um, that sunset clause in the ordinance, you will have two years from the date of application to bring your property into compliance. So it's from application date. Um, it's not from actual ordinance date. Um, that requirement just sunsets. As of right now, there, there hasn't been any talk on extending that. Um, but again, uh, time will tell as the ordinance moves forward. As of right now, I would plan on bringing your properties into compliance within that transition period. And uh, what uh, fire safety, uh, what's the fire safety aspect of uh, indoor cultivation? Terry, Scott? So, um, Oftentimes you're going to need a, some kind of an alarm system, uh, some things like that. Exiting we look at, uh, just pretty much the same things we would look at at any other commercial type business indoor. Um, but usually fire alarms, uh, fire flow. So the uh, if you have a hydrant nearby or a water storage tank, we want to look at that. And, um, and those things vary from building to building. Okay, and uh, going back to electrical, 
Um, can you have an electrical outlet outside and near an egg exempt structure, for example, an outlet to power a pump into into pump nutrients? So any kind of um, electrical work would require a permit. So even if you have um, like an ag pole or a standalone pedestal, that in itself would require uh, a permit. And then indoor or uh, hoop houses, mixed light, can't be supported with uh, temporary power. So something like that would ultimately, I think, have to be permitted. And uh, <clears throat> regarding um, with no ha hazardous materials on site or used for the cultivation, how close to a well or water source can a canopy, a cannabis canopy be? A uh, hundred feet is specified for hazardous waste. Amy, you want to take that one? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Sorry. <laughs> um, so when you're when you're talking about hazardous material, um, it's it's going to depend on the amount and the storage. We want to give as much of any setback from a residential well. Uh, obviously, a body of water that is managed by the state or a continuous stream or structure you want adequate setback. And so we try to put the extent of uh, hazardous material storage as far away from that parameter as possible. A hundred foot setback is obviously ideal. Um, sometimes there are conditions where that can't be met. And we can always work with the, uh, with the owner or operator to try a current well uh, that serves the home home, the potable water supply, which of course we know that sometimes these can impact residential wells of your neighbors. It depends on what aquifer they're tapped into. So we don't want to go and contaminate an entire uh, water water supply. Well, and, um, and with we no, certainly look if, at it. Uh, and if there is, if there are no hazardous materials on site, uh, how close then to a well could the uh, site be? So with no hazardous material on site, depending upon, I mean, at least a minimum 25-foot um, setback would be preferred. Um, we have made allocations to that, uh, if, if need be, because we're thinking about if you have an outdoor grow, let's just give that as an example, any runoff or any surface, hoping that your well uh, has an adequate steel because it's residential, we don't monitor those except for the initial install. So just to try to mitigate any runoff that may eventually come into contact uh, with your well, 25, 25 feet is an adequate setback. But again, if, if there's a concern, if there's an issue where it's being set, if you have, say, for example, a septic repair area that doesn't allow you to do that kind of setback, we can certainly review it. Um, project to project. Does that answer your, your question? I believe so. Um, Janae, could you maybe uh, add a little bit from uh, if we are talking about a um, state managed waterway? Sure. So that might be a water rights question because we, we're the Department of Water Quality and we're more concerned with um, where you're discharging the water to not where you're getting your water from. Um, so I actually don't know too much about um, water rights issues. You can email me any other questions, but we are concerned with what you're gonna do to manage your soils, to manage uh, any erosion, uh, where you're gonna store all your chemicals, your pesticides, herbicides, any petroleum products. Can you guys hear me? Yep, absolutely. Okay, just making sure. Um, and make sure that none of those chemicals and no extra sediment is going to be contaminating the waterways. And would Fish and Game have uh, anything uh, on that topic as well? Kyle? 
I don't have anything specific for wells unless a well is you know immediately adjacent to a perennial waterway and at some uh, very 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 shallow depth. And, we're and could you come closer to your microphone, please, because we have really trouble hearing you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, we don't have any specific authority over wells unless we're going to assert that the well is actually pulling from a surface water. But as far as setbacks from streams, Fishing Game Code has no specific setbacks from streams for cannabis cultivation, uh, except that there are code sections that uh, restrict delivery of deleterious materials to a stream. So if, you're, if your cultivation area is close enough to a stream that reasonably those materials could enter a stream, then you could potentially be in violation of Fishing Game Code. But if you're abiding by the um, water board setbacks, then generally you're going to be okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a follow-up question for Jason. Uh, it says, Jason, uh, were you saying that if you had a permitted power outside an ag exempt structure, it would have to be permitted? And what would the actual would the actual structure then still be considered ag exempt? So that really depends. Uh, it's case by case basis, and ultimately it depends on what you're using that power for. Um, if you're going to use that to power lights or a fan inside a greenhouse, then that does not um, make it ag exempt. Um, again, if, if you were to have the power, it has to be permitted. Um, and say you were using power tools, uh, weed whacker, leaf blower, edge or something like that on a temporary basis that you could plug in and then unplug when not using, that would be fine. But you cannot use that in to, to bring power inside to the greenhouse for, for anything that's gonna stay in there. Again, lighting, fans, uh, any kind of heating system. So it really depends on what you're gonna use that power for. Generally, I'll just jump in. Generally speaking, if there's any utilities as part of those structures, they're not considered exempt. Um, so as a general rule, that's what you can use. Um, again, case by case proposals, we've been reviewing different setups and what they're used for. Um, but it, generally speaking, they, they wouldn't be exempt. Um, the other thing, Pascal, I was gonna, Lucas, jump in on sensitive sites related to setbacks to waterways, things like that. I think that was relevant yep. to the last conversation. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so from perennial waterways, meaning that they run year round, we have 100 fat, uh, foot setback requirements. And then for seasonal waterways, they could be a pond or a stream, uh, it would be 50 feet. So that would be for any cultivation activities, but also any sort of ground disturbance. So if you're grading, uh, placing a structure, uh, building a road, anything like that, you would have to abide by those setbacks. Um, hi, the Water Board actually has a little bit stricter of um, repairing setbacks for perennial class one water courses. Uh, we expect a 150 foot setback distance. Good to know. And um, we have a, a message from uh, Amy that says, also an item to consider is if the grow is in or around Wolf Creek. Wolf Creek is considered by the State Water Board as an impacted body of water to which the Environmental Health Department is charged to ensure that the utmost restriction and adherence to setbacks is important. As an, as an example, septic systems require a 400 foot setback one uh, since the updated state on-site wastewater treatment system policy. So the same would apply for runoff, especially into Wolf Creek. And if we go back to the ag exam greenhouses, another question is, uh, is there a maximum number of ag exam greenhouses that you can have per acre? So uh, the way we allow for the ag exemption is if you have three or more acres, you're allowed one ag exempt uh, greenhouse per acre and they can be clustered. So for instance, if you have five acres, you can be allowed five ag exempt greenhouses um, and they can be clustered all in one area as long as they're separated by at least five feet. But um, th there is, no limitation on the numbers, it just depends on your acreage. Again, uh, one per acre if you have more than three acres. And then um, regarding uh, accessory 
immature plant areas, can you have support areas measured similar to canopy areas with walkways not being counted as square footage? Uh, the simple answer to that is no. Um, so when it comes to support areas, um, we, we take the whole structure into consideration. Um, we made an allowance for, for canopy because it's, it's just that. It's the definition of canopy is measured around the plant. So we'd have allowed for allowances to take out that walkway uh, within a, a greenhouse. But for the support structures, we take into account the whole structure. And again, keeping in mind that with CEQA, we have limitations on impervious surface. And if we continue to keep adding that impervious surface, it, it could cause problems with CEQA. And ultimately, it's, we don't allow that for support area. And um, a question from uh, Kaylin is, if I'm going through the permit process along with a grow built out to code, would pg e be able to drop the needed power before, during, or after I get the permits? Um, if, it really kind of depends on what you have on your parcel. Generally speaking, if you have a permitted use for that power, then that's when you're allowed to have power on that site. So if you have a vacant parcel, you can't get power until you have issued building permits for that specific use. So if you're gonna build greenhouses or a house or whatever, you would get um, permitted power on site once you have those permits in hand. Um, if you had existing improvements on the site and you were continuing to build that out and you wanted to change some components on your site based on adding another meter or another panel or something like that, we've been reviewing that on a case by case. And if it makes sense, we've been allowing issuance of those permits for power or changes to the infrastructure on site um, while you have permits in review. And can you run po uh, power, permitted power, to an ag exam greenhouse to power a motor outside the greenhouse to open and close a blackout cover? No. Go, no. go ahead. So, um, so that I'd, I'd say no, because uh, once you have something motorized, that makes it no longer ag exempt. So just because it's on the outside of the structure, it's still an integral part of it. Um, therefore, it has power and it would not be ag exempt. And uh, we're going back to the support areas. What if the support area is outside? Any so that would have to be there? kind of a case by case basis. So if you're talking about having um, certain areas delineated for say immature plants for support area, we, we kind of have to talk about what your setup is. Um, that would be more of a case by case basis. And uh, I would like to hear from um, Ashley um, what resources Circle has and, and, and can um, bring in for, especially for people who, who are starting out and uh, what people can do to make sure that um, both the Yuba and uh, its feeder streams are well preserved. Thanks, Pascal. Yeah, um, I think that our Growing Green program is a great place for people to start to really um, understand an overview, a very high overview of the legal cultivation in Nevada County, as well as some BMP um, recommendations. So if you go to going, uh, go, um, Growing Green for the Yuba.org um, or go to our Cannabis Impacts um, page on the Yuba River.org, which is Circle's main website, you can find those resources listed. We've also published a number of Nevada County's resources. So if you can't find it on their website, you can also find it there. Um, thanks to uh, Craig and Jason and others, I just want to make sure that everyone can find those resources available. And then Circle also in partnership with the Alliance and support of our lovely regional water board and with the support of the Rose Foundation produced three BMP videos featuring local Nevada County farmers. And those are available on our YouTube channel. Um, Pascal also posted one um, in the article featuring an advertising for today's event. And there are a number of BMPs that are specifically highlighted in that video that those farmers have found to be very successful in mitigating the environmental impacts of cannabis cultivation, as well as efficiently using resources. So helping with, you know, healthy soil as well as water conservation. And I think that those techniques not only help our watershed, but also help growers produce better crops. And they really highlight the incredible culture of small growers in our community. And so I encourage you to watch those. Those are great resources. And 
Um, if you have additional questions, we are also more than happy to answer those in collaboration with the other people on this call. Um, so if you have any additional questions about BMPs, I think that those are listed um, effectively beneath each video. And then Circle will be producing a formal BMP document in consultation with the county here later this month. Thank you. And Diana, if, if I'm just starting out, um, what benefit would the Alliance have for, for somebody who just starts out? Well, I think there's, it's twofold. Number one is the, the resources that we can offer somebody. So for example, the initial assessment that we do with our buddy program has proven extremely successful. We've had um, close to two dozen participants in that program that are moving through the process currently. Um, and so it's, we have a, a really strong success rate with that. In addition, we have a tremendous amount of um, support through our Get Legit workshop series, which again, teach business skills as well as permitting skills or um, permitting and regulatory um, information. Um, and then there's, just, there's a lot of support around the members themselves. So we have over 200 members. We have an internal network where we share resources, where we collaborate on phone calls. And so, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of our uh, permitted and licensed uh, farmers in the county are members of the Alliance. And so we're really creating a community here that uh, sets the the foundation for a very healthy, uh, sustainable, long-term cannabis industry. Um, so uh, we encourage people to join. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Patricia is asking, must canopy space be contiguous? And if no, what's the maximum distance? It does not have to be contiguous. Uh, I'm going to try and share an image here. Um, can you see the... Yep. PowerPoint. Yes. So what this shows is different uh, samples or variations of canopy uh, outline, which is available on the Nevada County Cannabis Compliance Division uh, webpage. This shows some different examples. It does not have to be contiguous, but it has to be easily measurable. Um, again, case by case basis. You could have individual pots, um, but the canopy area has to be clearly delineated. So you can't just have the pot and it grow outside and say, oh, I'm going to allow three or four feet outside without it being clearly marked. So there has to be some kind of stake, pole, um, some kind of mark, but we have um, eased up the restrictions on, on canopy. So what we don't want to see is kind of a glob or a thousand um, small areas because we have to come out there and measure every one of them and we need something realistic and, and reasonable that we can measure but again we allow um, quite different variations and something to keep in size for maximum size is how much land you're going to impact and just uh, you know if you have to cut down trees you want to minimize that so you don't want it spread out over acres and acres uh, might be more beneficial to keep it more in a confined area. Okay, and um, if you have two or more parcels with direct access, would one permit cover all the parcels? So in that case, no. Um, you'd have to apply per parcel. So each parcel is considered its own kind of entity. So if you're to grow on multiple parcels, you'd have to have multiple permits. Uh, something to keep in mind with that is you still have the 100 foot setback. So if you own two neighboring parcels, um, you cannot have them right up along that property line, even if you own both properties. Uh, and the reason being is uh, down, the, down the road in the future, if you sell one of the parcels, now all of a sudden it's non-compliant. So even if you own multiple parcels, even if they're next to each other, you still have to follow the, the same rules as if it was a single uh, parcel. And um, in, in, since we're talking parcels, what about, um, could you do a lot line adjustment? And then, uh, for example, the person who asked for, uh, before for the variances, could you do a lot line adjustment instead of a variance? And what kind of issues could a property have that would then warrant the variance? I can take this one. Mm -hmm. um, so you are welcome to do a lot line adjustment to try to make your parcel more advantageous for cannabis cultivation. Uh, you can do it to increase property size or you could merge with an adjacent parcel 
to meet the acreage minimums that would allow you to cultivate the size you want. Um, so that's definitely a possibility and we have several that are in process. You can run your lot line adjustment concurrently with your cannabis permit uh, as long as the lot line adjustment is finalized prior to approval. Um, and for variances, the things, the main issue with variance is that you have to be able to prove in that public setting that you have a parcel that is at a disadvantage such as because of topography or biological resources or some other issue um, that would make your parcel less buildable than one of similar size in the similar area. Um, one of the things people propose a lot is that they've constructed something previously that didn't meet standards and they're trying to use a variance to make it meet standards and unfortunately that finding can't be made because it was constructed without the initial review process um, which kind of invalidates the ability for a variance. So in other words, no after the fact permits? Essentially, it would be hard for us to prove that you built it there because you were at a disadvantage if you constructed it there without a review process. Okay, great. And what are the major differences in requirements and costs between two different permits under tw uh, 2,500 square foot and uh, over that? So there, there's not um, a great difference between the two of them. Um, I think planning can also speak to this. Um, th there is a lower threshold for the 2,500 square feet and under, um, quicker turnaround time, and it is uh, slightly less costly. Um, they are fairly similar. Um, I think Luke can speak a little bit more to the ADP. Yeah, the main difference is that the CCP, which is the smaller of the two licensing types, is a permit that was specifically developed with cannabis in mind. Uh, the larger type is an administrative development permit, which is a permitting type that is more commonly used for equipment for cell towers and things like that. Um, so it has legislated timelines of 30 days. We're mandated to give people 21 days and outside agencies for review so that they can make comments on your project. Um, so because it is legislated, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of wiggle room. We have to abide by those ordinances um, and we can't t rush a review process with another agency. And um, what, um, a question is, why is the county building department regulating low voltage power that is not being regulated by national state building code when there aren't any life or, sa life or safety issues? So originally when we had ag exempt structures before they were of the size that they are, we got asked questions throughout this process, mainly related to the cannabis ordinance for allowing utilities in those structures. We looked at all kinds of different codes in different areas and tried to find some sort of flexibility for that that met the intent of the state requirement. One of those was the allowance of low voltage lighting or fans that met the intent of that exemption in the California Electrical Code. The intent of that is to keep the actual threshold under the voltage and wattage limits. So if you stack 100 of those in a singular structure, you're not meeting the intent. Again, we're gonna to continue to try to look at different um, options for this moving forward because we get this question a lot. But as of right now, that's um, the reason we treat it that way. And one thing I'll add to that, because this is this is an issue that's come up a lot with our members as a, as a priority to look at. And so we've been exploring um, what sort of options exist in other counties as it relates to um, various solar or power allowances in other counties that have um, ag exempt hoop houses. And so, um, yeah, as Craig said, we're working collaboratively with the county to explore all options and just, you know, see what we can learn from from other areas while still ensuring that health and safety um, is met. And um, you also have a buddy program, don't you? Yes, we do. Talk a little bit about it. Sure, our buddy program, um, it starts out with an initial assessment where um, we ask about 
um, a dozen questions about um, just the nature of um, a new applicant's project. And we match them, they answer the questions, and then they get matched up with a farmer that has already been permitted. And that, that permitted farmer is their buddy. Um, they help to answer questions. Um, but really the purpose of it is so that a new person, a new farmer that's coming in um, who says, can I do this? What does this look like? What are the costs? Um, it, it helps with that just initial review. Um, and so that's the purpose of it. It's been, as I said, very, very successful. Um, um, we've had over um, uh, two dozen participants so far. And so um, really we want to get word out early um, this summer, uh, letting people know about it for the fall so that uh, farmers that are looking to transition for 20, uh, the ne next grow season um, really can start the process early. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a, a great program. And it also helps us with our advocacy um, efforts uh, to understand where people are at, what some of the challenges people are having so that we can best um, advocate. Great. And um, uh, Jason, uh, the PowerPoint that uh, you pulled up, is that available somewhere online? Yes, it is. Um, if you go to www.mynevadacounty.com, um, and in the search bar, you can type Cannabis Compliance Division. It'll bring you to our webpage. Or the long route is to go through Departments, CDA. You can find it through there. Uh, we do have a list of handouts, frequently asked questions, and that PowerPoint is on that site. Okay, great. Um, how long does it take to go through a 2,500-square-foot canopy on an ag forest property uh, 10 acres with no permitted structures and can one grow on the property while going through the process? So that's really going to be um, case by case dependent. Uh, I would, my honest answer is you're probably already late to the game if you want to grow this year, if you're talking with bare land, no permitted structures. Part of the ordinance states that you must have a permitted residence on the property so that in itself can take some time. It depends on what needs to be done to the property, um, how extensive the, the structures you're doing, is there grading, is there access issues. So those are all things that need to be considered with the residents before you even take into, consider it, into consideration the uh, cannabis permitting. Um, it, it's, there are too many variables to really say how long it can take. Uh, we have had somebody go through our permitting process in, in as quick as three months, and some people it takes a lot longer. It just depends on um, the amount of work you're doing, what's being done, uh, if you hit any kind of complications. Um, there, there are just so many variables to that. But my best advice is to uh, have a plan, uh, stick to that, and stay on top of it, and if there's any kind of corrections you need to make to that plan, stay on that and get those corrections back as soon as possible and that'll help speed along the process at least. What, what I would say to that question too is uh, another resource that I don't know if we mentioned yet, but there's a frequently asked questions uh, on the Cannabis Division website as well. It speaks to this as well. Um, so there's information in there that talks about if you have bare land, what is required minimally to um, start cultivating on site. It talks about having a permitted septic in a well, uh, a building issued for a house and living in an RV on site. So there, there is some flexibility if you have no improvements on site to get you cultivating on site while you work through your process and the construction on site. So is it, it isn't just black and white like Jason said, and there are some options for you. Um, the frequently asked questions on our website addresses a lot of those things. And um, I saw another question pop up just asking if the dwelling has to be completed prior to application, um, and it does not. So you do have to have the residence applied for, and you have to have begun construction um, by the time uh, you can currently apply for your, your cannabis permit. Um, but something with that is you have to have um, an RV or a camper on site and that has to be part of your permit that you live in um, while you're going through that process. So you have to have begun construction on the home, you have to be living in an RV on site, and then you can go through that uh, application process. 
So you don't have to have the house completed at the time of application. And, One thing uh, too, but Pascal, sorry to interrupt you. Just to touch on what you mentioned to Diana earlier about the buddy program and just really talk about how important things like that are, you know, whether that's a buddy program, whether that's asking somebody, you know, that's in or going through the process, that experience is by far the best teacher. So the, if I was to give one thing or one piece of advice for people that want to get into the industry or start cultivating, that's it. Um, the importance of that and that having that as a tool is, is an amazing thing. And um, this, this is probably a, a question that's probably for our fire folks. Um, how do we know when we need to maintain access to driveway standards versus road standards on really long driveways with only a few residences? Pascal, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Scotty. All right. Um, so that's, again, going to be a case-by-case -case basis. It's based on the distance from the uh, last uh, traditional road uh, to the site access point. Um, and then taking into consideration um, radiuses of curves, slopes, topographies, um, and even in certain situations, the, uh, the surface material comes into play as well. It's a, it is a case by case and is reviewed um, solely for that applicant. And um, we have uh, some questions. This is, okay, will the county ever be open to type seven volatile instructions that other counties allow with proper safety, uh, uh, such as uh, C1, D1 and C1, D2 build outs? And I have no idea what I just asked you. So currently Nevada County does not allow that, but we are looking into different licensing types through the state. Um, and I'll add to that is that um, we have submitted to the county um, in January um, based off of input from the membership and um, with the goal of creating a uh, um, an economically sustainable um, supply chain here, cannabis supply chain here in Nevada County, um, several additional state license types for the unincorporated part of the county, which which does include type seven. There's definitely um, a, a place for that, we believe, in the, in the unincorporated county and business opportunities there. And uh, just as a follow-up on the um, res residents on the property, can it be a travel trailer instead of an RV, Jason? Yes. That, that was easy. And how much of the finished product is required to send in for testing under a CCP and ADP permit? The, the county doesn't require testing. I believe that's a state requirement. Ah. And <clears throat> with that, we went through the questions. Um, everybody just... Uh, on the call and also on video, just know that uh, Nevada County, again, the uh, cannabis section of Nevada County, there is a plethora of links and resources, the FAQs that uh, Craig mentioned, there is contact. Uh, and we will also recap on the, uh, on the story page, we will recap, we have uh, a PowerPoint that Janae has uh, sent to us. Uh, we will repeat the embed uh, circles uh, video again and uh, to our um, panelists, if you have anything, any of the resources that you want us to list on that um, live video page, uh, please feel free to, to send them. And I would like to end by asking uh, each of you, um, what would you like, um, potential uh, growers, what would you like them to know about um, what you do and uh, why, why are there so many regulations? Can you talk to us a little bit, each of you, why are there so many regulations? Why, and what everybody else, what you're doing, what do you want people to really understand? Um, I'll jump in and, and just start with, remember this is a commercial business. Um, just as any other commercial business. Um, I don't want to make generalizations, but I think a, a lot of the, the growers in their experience, they haven't 
had to deal with a lot of regulation, um, doing it outside the law, possibly. But now that it is legal, keep in mind it is commercial. There are these regulations and it is treated the same as any other commercial business or entity. Um, it can seem overwhelming and intimidating, but just don't give up, work through it. We're, we're willing to help you. We want to see you legal. Just don't get discouraged. Don't give up. We're here to help you. I think to add on to that also is, uh, yes, these are commercial operations. We don't treat them any different than the fire service. Uh, I think the big difference is the locations of uh, these operations. They're out, you know, on dead end roads and, and some places like that. So that uh, is a little more challenging for us in the fire service to, uh, to work on those roads and, and deal with uh, fire flow requirements and, and um, dead end road standards and, and all those things that come into play when you're out in a rural area. Thank you, Terry. So one thing I'll add just, um, just to generally say, this is brand new too, is just to keep that in mind. The, the industry has been out there forever, you know, it, but the local regulations specifically here hasn't been around that long. I think uh, today or yesterday was the mark of one year where we had an adopted ordinance, which again, that's it's brand new. So um, it may seem overwhelming, um, but it, hang in there. It will become normalized in the state and here locally um, to where this is a normal type of permit. This is a normal commercial culture. It's a respected business. I will say at the county level, uh, from a board perspective and a lot of elected members at the county as well as staff, um, they recognize and value that this is a resource here locally. And so we want to embrace it and try to bring it into a local regulated market. That's challenging, um, but we're not looking at this year or the following year, we're looking 10, 20 years out when we're trying to build this successful program. So it's really just more of a hang in there. I'll add to that. Thanks so much for saying that, Craig, and I, I definitely concur that this has been a new process for everybody. And at the Cannabis Alliance, we too are looking out looking forward to what this looks like five years, 10 years from now, and how can we really um, build a very strong uh, cannabis economy here. Um, and so, you know, and, and kind of to echo or say what um, Jason was talking about, this is a very complex uh, commercial land use policy. And um, we look forward to the next advancements of our local policy so that we can, um, uh, create more consistent standards with some like industries, specifically ag. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, reviews of policy that had been passed um, that's being re-reviewed by various Board of Supervisors in, in differing counties, but rural cannabis producing counties to create consistencies with the agriculture industries because what's happening is, is because due to some of these really complex uh, commercial land use policies, it's, it's, discouraging a lot of people that we want to bring in. So um, we're, we're going to be exploring that and, and advocating for ways that we can remove barriers to entry. Um, and also, how do we need to adjust policy moving forward so that we can compete in a, um, a, a national game when federal legalization uh, um, happens or even when the exportation of cannabis internationally happens. So um, yeah, trying to look forward as it relates to cannabis policy and, and what does things look like here locally in terms of um, uh, collaborating with other industries, our, our wellness industries and our uh, traditional ag industries. And thank you. Ashley, Janae. Uh, hey, uh, Scott, can you Evan, if um, part, part of the review process for the planning department, which um, ultimately is what's tied back to the state allowing us to have a cannabis program is compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, so a large portion of it is we did an environmental impact report in 2018 and making sure that these projects adhere to that um, 
basically it was a uh, environmental impact to show what type of damage would be caused to the environment caused by cannabis and sticking within those bounds. And so every time we permit a cannabis permit, we're telling the state that it fits within the bounds of those of that EIR. Um, and so making sure that the cannabis permits adhere to that EIR is how we're continued to, being able to continue to issue permits in this county. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, we have to know, Janae, are you still with us here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, to echo what everyone else has said, that we're here to help. We want the process to go as smoothly as possible. Um, if we all like going on inspections, if you want us to come out to Nevada County, we can, we can arrange to come out there and help you figure out what to do to get you in compliance or help stay in compliance, brainstorm together. Um, so don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we're interested in partnering to protect water call protect water quality. Perfect, thank you. Kyle? Yeah, I'll just echo what Janae just said. Um, reach out to us early and often. Um, we're here to help get you through the permitting process as well as protect fish and wildlife resources. Um, you know, where we can we can do some, some small bit of consultation prior to your notification um, and kind of help you guide your your site placement and such to avoid resources but um yeah just reach out anytime with any questions we've got four staff in our shop now um and you can get our contact information on our website there's also um a video of one of our permitting webinars on the website on our website as well and a lot of resources available for um, permitting through and we'll make sure to link to that as well thank you Pascal, I just, this is Ashley at yes. Circle, and I just wanted to add, um, I want to thank everyone on this call and reiterate that this is a brand new process. Growing Green for the Yuba was started many years ago with the acknowledgement that the environmental impacts from cannabis cultivation were real and present in the Yuba River watershed. But Nevada County is the only one out of the four counties that overlays the Yuba River watershed that has taken the initiative and leadership to you know, implement these regulations. And I know what an incredible amount of work that has taken and incredible stakeholder collaboration. And um, the resources that are just on this call alone are, are pretty unusual um, statewide. And so I think that it, I just want to applaud everyone here and really reiterate their request. Contact them early and often. Um, we want to help really alleviate and mitigate those impacts to the Uber River watershed as best we can. But we know that the only way to do that is moving forward with the compliance structure. structure. And um, I, I really think that um, everyone is working really hard to help that happen. So I thank everyone for, for doing your part and look forward to this developing and growing and normalizing, as Craig said. Thank you, Ashley. Amy, are you back with us? Amy, can you hear us? There you are. I believe Amy has really some technical difficulties, also known as really poor internet connectivity, which is also a, a thing here in Nevada County. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay, I was just commenting that Scott, you were you were killing me because I felt like I was watching a reality TV show, and and you were going to do some major cool stunt or something there for a second. So I, I was getting a little little wigged out. Um, but I agree with everyone, all your comments. I think that it is um, important that everybody knows in the industry that we're here to support you. And we are here to work through any issues that may come up. Um, and I know that Craig and Lucas and Jeff and his team and Jason, everyone is very, really looking out to help you be successful. So um, anything we can do, I, I think it's important. Yes, there are laws. Yes, there are mandates and standards we have to adhere to. But we can always find ways to uh, work with you and do it safely. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, Scott, um, anything you want to add? And where are you? 
Well, Pasco, I'm uh, I got a cover where uh, you met me uh, a couple years back. Kind of echo everybody else's comments. Um, you know, you're embarking on a major commercial venture. It's going to come with ups and downs. Um, to add to it, that uh, local fire marshals have put together a checklist uh, that kind of will give you a a brief uh, knowledge as to what we're going to be looking at uh, down the road when your site is at or nearing completion. Um, there is a lot of components. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them come with some uh, some price tags as well. And uh, but, but again, we are all here to ensure that you get through this process and uh, uh, become legal and come compliant. But uh, I unfortunately I have to run. But uh, all right. Mention. Okay, thank, thank you everybody and uh, thanks everybody, thanks to our panelists and thanks for the great questions that everybody had. We will again, we will have the resources uh, will be listed on the, on the story page with the videos and every link that we can uh, add to it, happy to do that. With that I would like to thank the panelists again, thank our attendees and um, the next um, meeting, uh, the next town hall goes back to the usual um, Thursday. And for to our uh, attendees, before you leave, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a comment to say if you like this format, if you find it useful, uh, either is this uh, useful for you and uh, is it good, you, are your questions being answered? Would love to hear some feedback from you. With that, thank you everybody, goodbye. <laughs>